Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Norcross. Luke Doris is off today, but he'll be back on the podcast next week. This is podcast number 10 of Hurricane Season 2020 and number 48 in our series. Today, we're going to talk to senior hurricane researcher Brian McNulty at the University of Miami. He works on many aspects of hurricane computer modeling and verification and is very knowledgeable about uh, everything to do with hurricane forecasting. If you follow Weather Twitter, you see a lot from Brian. He also has a great website with technical weather resources, including access to his blogs. So we'll talk to him about Hurricane Laura, the state of forecasting science, and the challenges of communicating about extreme weather and climate. We're recording this portion of the podcast on Thursday, August 27, 2020. If you're listening at some point in the future, you've got to tune into Local 10 in South Florida for Local 10 News, of course, or Local10.com, where we stream Local 10 News live and free at any time. So if you can't watch TV, you can always just go to Local10.com and watch Local 10 News live. And also we have the Max Tracker Hurricane app, which will give you the latest advisory information or the Local 10 weather app for current information as well. Okay, in the tropics right now, it's uh, really all about Hurricane Laura, of course. Laura made landfall last night at about 1 a.m. Central Time or overnight uh, early this morning, I guess. A very fortuitous thing happened. It veered just a little bit to the right. Uh, just to the east, just before landfall. And that put the strongest winds just east of the Calcasieu Lake and River system that goes up to uh, Lake Charles. And the entrance to that system uh, is uh, its a whole series of, of lakes and rivers. Go about 30 miles north up to I-10, even goes past there, as a matter of fact. And that, in theory opens up the possibility of salt water being pushed that entire distance, 30, 35 miles at least up uh, even past Lake Charles, and it would potentially flood Lake Charles. Well, for that to happen, the strongest winds in the hurricane have to be blowing directly on shore right up through the Calcasieu Pass, uh, because, but because uh, Laura jogged just a little bit to the right, that peak surge missed the opening. Instead of being 15 to 20 feet, it was more like 9 feet above normal high tide level. And that small difference in track made a tremendous difference. What happened farther north up the uh, Calcachu River up there to Lake Charles, which only got moderate flooding and it really didn't flood most of the city where the city would have been flooded with that 15 to 20 foot storm surge. So it was, uh, it was so fortuitous. We'll talk to Brian McNulty about that here in just a minute. In fact, let's go ahead and bring in Brian McNulty from the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, or what we call Rasmus, or they call Rasmus, at the University of Miami, and we'll get his take on all of this. Brian's been involved in a large number of uh, various projects related to hurricanes and local Miami climate. So Let's say hi to Brian McNulty. Hi, Brian. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, Brian. I appreciate the <laughs> offer to be here along with you. You're very welcome. So before we talk about all the things that you're doing and what's going on, uh, let's talk about Hurricane Laura since just uh, last night it made landfall. Uh, so a strong high pressure system over the Atlantic pushed Laura to the west, kind of past us. And then the storm turned north around the western edge of that high. And it was a super close call at landfall, whether the worst of the storm surge was going to go up the Calcasieu River all the way up to Lake Charles. And it didn't in a big way as it might have because it just missed by just that little much. But as a scientist, uh, I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you'd still say it was an excellent hurricane forecast, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for... Probably the last three or four days, the forecasts for the track have been virtually spot on, um, un unwavering. Um, when, when you're talking about forecasts that are three or four days out and you end up being five, ten miles off, that's, that's insignificant, really. I mean, that's, that's excellent. Yeah, even though it does make such a dramatic difference when you have a, an opening like the Calcasieu Pass there, where the water can come from the Gulf and flood a city, right? Where Absolutely. in this case, it just moved that little bit. So it ended up 
We don't know really what the storm surge was yet. They have to go out and actually measure it, I guess. But a relatively unpopulated or a very unpopulated part of the coast ended up getting the worst of it. Yeah, yeah. It really, I mean, for what the situation was, I, I suppose one could say it turned out as well as it as could. It, as um, it could have, yeah. You know, it's still a, a, an awful situation there for anyone there. But, uh, yeah, you're exactly right that it, it it did manage to squeak into the least populated part of the coastline. Kind of reminds me of was it Hurricane Brett that went into Brett. Texas? Category four went into the place on the Texas coast where nobody lives. I mean, yeah, right South in the Kennedy County Island. there. Yeah, nineteen ninety nine. Yes, I remember that one too. Of this this example of like, well, you found the place to hit to yeah. affect as few people as possible. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing thing. So. I mean, obviously, from a general public standpoint, they would like us, you guys, you know, scientists that work on hurricane models and whatnot, to be able to know these things uh, somewhat farther in advance. So is it, do you think, um, is there some kind of technology that is coming along that we need to come along to better measure exactly that high pressure system, the, the nose of it, you know, how strong it is? is to the west or is this just in the noise and essentially you know as good as we're ever as a practical matter going to be able to do because it was as you say an amazingly accurate forecast turns out that is a an amazingly excellent question uh, that's actually a hotly debated topic uh, especially with track forecasting is uh are we as good as we can get and the answer seems to be we're getting there mm -hmm. like really close mm -hmm. um, because there is a limit. You, you can't, we won't ever be able to predict the future perfectly out for as many days as we want to. Yeah, sort of by, there's a like a scientific rule, right? I mean, it's a chaotic system. Therefore, it cannot it, be absolutely forecast by like a fundamental theory of science. That's exactly right. Yeah, it is, it is absolutely impossible to ever do a perfect forecast other than by luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and sometimes people are lucky. And actually, if you if you always forecast it to hit the city, you know, that gives you the opportunity to say, see, I was the one that forecasted to hit the city when it does hit the city, right? <laughs> as yeah. long as you ignore all the times you're wrong. But it's, yeah. it's, it's the only way. And if you look at the track for Laura, actually, they, it really was a wobble that made the difference. It really it, wobbled it to the right of Cameron and then it wobbled back to the left and kind of went on that same straight line. It, it really, yeah, it really yeah. was. It's an amazing it thing. Yeah. Uh, I, well, actually, to get, to get back to your, your previous question, too, uh, that, that doesn't mean we need to not keep trying, obviously, to improve forecasts, because there is still some room to do that. And one of the ways that we don't want to kind of leave behind is we need to observe things were you know this is the we have uh, air force and NOAA planes that fly into storms they fly around storms uh, those are extremely important mm -hmm. um, to kind of get a sense of what's going on in the atmosphere ahead of the storm and in the storm and uh, those those need to happen um, but isn't but, the yeah. isn't the real answer to that to throw drones up there and throw more drones and throw them more often and have them range out farther into the space around the storm and you know measure the well, crap out of it right I mean that, you would think right that that, that would be great <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can do a lot with money is I think the right. the axiom uh, that comes into play there when it looked like a few days ago there was a threat to Houston mm -hmm. and a number of the credible uh, models were putting the storm near Houston or Houston Galveston or in, indeed just south of there, which is uh, 1900 hurricane territory and and uh, all these terrible storms in that region. Were you surprised that the Hurricane Center had enough confidence in the forecast that they didn't put up hurricane warnings for Houston? You know, they they stuck with the tropical storm warning. They didn't they didn't commit uh, to. You know, they just had confidence, and, and and really that difference of of just the smallest amount uh, would have made such a tremendous difference in the forecast back then. Now, as it turned out, of course, it ended up up close to uh, Cameron, Louisiana, in terms of the landfall point. But were you surprised? I was I was surprised 
given the downside of a hurricane hit in Metro Houston, which is about as bad as it can be, that that uh, it took guts to not not commit to that. I I would say I was a bit surprised too. Um, I think this kind of speaks to where we are with the skill of track mm -hmm. forecasting. That by the time you're two days out and watches start getting issued, or you're one and a half days out and that watch is upgraded to a warning, when you're that close. There's enough trust in what the models are showing um, that you just, it's really hard to see it going anywhere else, but you know, where. Although the, the in this case, the consensus model, going. consensus model never went to Houston, right? The consensus model, like the average of the model. Exactly. But, but some, they, I mean, the, the the European, which has been kind of crappy this year, I must say, has uh, been, been kind of all over the place this year. Uh, which is annoying uh, because so many people look at that and get kind of ill-informed by that. Uh, and the UK Met was over there too, which is, has tough. been the last couple of years a really good uh, model. And the American GFS model, the much maligned American <laughs> GFS model, actually didn't bite on that. It stayed, uh, stayed to the right. So that consensus model, which is what we show on TV, never... <laughs> went completely there. So I guess that's really what they have confidence in, right? It is. And so they, they put a lot of weight on that because it's, it's kind of the, you know, when you have this ensemble of ensembles, mm -hmm. you have each individual of those, like the UK Med and the European GFS, you have those runs. They each run an ensemble of lots of members. Right. And when you kind of glue all those together into like the average in a smart way, it's really, really hard to beat that. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, and normally it's more or less down the middle of the cone. Although yeah. when they, uh, you know, they don't always, when it's a big change in the models, they don't commit to the big change right away. And and that ended up actually being the the uh, determining factor and, and the correct decision to mm -hmm. only incrementally move the track a little bit to the left uh, and not, involve metropolitan houston galveston in the direct path of the storm yeah it's kind of amazing thing in in houston and and galveston they've talked uh well a, since before hurricane ike i think but since hurricane ike about putting a barrier up across the entrance to galveston bay called the ike dike uh, uh in order to stop storm surge from going in the bay because you have billions and billions of dollars of petrochemical facilities up in Galveston Bay, between the money involved, the refining capacity for the country involved, and the uh, danger of, of pollution involved by running storm surge up there, it, it feels like a, a cheap thing. And you hear people in um, South Florida talk about, well, we ought to put up walls or dikes or something like that. We can't we can't block off Biscayne Bay here because it's not a little, a little narrow opening like they have in Texas, but do you ever get involved in policy discussions? Uh, I don't mean officially, or maybe you do officially. I don't know. But do you ever, you know, get involved in discussions like that at the school at the uh, University of Miami? And or, uh, for instance, the Corps of Engineers has talked about putting up a flood wall, kind of more or less along Biscayne Boulevard in yeah. in uh, Miami. Is that, or are you more on the sort of academic scientific? Uh, side of this well i in an unofficial capacity uh, i am uh, on the science advisory board for a company called coastal risk consulting uh and they they kind of have have me on there as someone who kind of just looks at, at what what they're doing and, you know um to, does what we're doing look good to you you know mm -hmm. or is it scientifically sound um and so in that regard um there, I, you know, I, I do have kind of an unofficial, um, strong interest in these sorts of measures like walls and, uh, you know, off, offshore structures to, to try to reduce storm surge and things like that. So, is there, yeah. you know, is there an answer to the South Florida storm surge uh, problem? I, you know, obviously I got a lot of questions uh, with uh, the 20-foot storm surges being talked about. In Louisiana, can we have a 20-foot storm surge here? And of course, 
The answer is yes, in just the wrong situation in Biscayne Bay, not yeah. at the on the on Miami Beach or or Fort Lauderdale Beach or something. But uh, I mean, it can be plenty high. <laughs> but but yeah. the twenty foot numbers and the super high numbers are in Biscayne Bay, almost like Hurricane Andrew did. Is there, you know, practically speaking, any sort of uh, solution in the offing or that that you think really has promise for changing the storm surge dynamic in South Florida? Honestly, practically, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there are ideas. Like, like mm -hmm. the, the, when you mentioned the, the Army Corps of Engineers has this concept where you have basically a, a, a three-piece significant wall um, that is meant to kind of keep storm surge away from going up rivers and canals of three different locations mm -hmm. that could flood enormous amounts of land and people. Right. Uh, this, this would be an incredible undertaking. I, I can't even imagine. Um, and then, you know, aside from that, can, can we do anything further east offshore? There's talk of that to build, mm -hmm. like I was maybe mentioned before briefly was the, the offshore structures kind of thing, just to kind of the Venice, break. Venice, Italy idea where they have this underwater thing that comes up and, in theory, I don't know. Did they ever make that work? You know, it was I under construction know. for a decade. Or anyway, there are a whole lot of scandals involved with it. But the idea is, it's this underwater structure that lifts, right, and, yeah. and blocks essentially. But uh, I mean, how big would that have to be, and and how would that even begin to work? Yeah, I, I, it's it's hard to envision something practical mm -hmm. working without it being a, just an absurd, unthinkable amount of money. Yeah, money and just physical stature to, to yeah. actually block the power of, of the storm surge, which is dramatic, uh, yeah. for sure. And and uh, where Erasmus, the uh, University of Miami, part of University of Miami where uh, you work, is there on Virginia Key, uh, right next to this aquarium. Now, you guys, talking about tides, have a tide monitoring station there, and you measure water temperature as well. How long has that been there? And and talk about the records that you've seen there over the last year or two, two or three. Sure, like yeah. That. Yeah, yeah. that was put in in uh, 1994. Uh, so it's not an incredibly long period of record, but it's long enough to see some interesting things happen. Um, most of which is, you know, over that time period, when you account for known oscillations and things like that sea levels risen there by about five and a half inches just wow. since 1994 mm -hmm. um because it's just, about a foot since like for 100 years right going back to the yeah uh, early measurements in miami beach i think back in 1912 or something whenever they were measured yeah yeah uh and so, so for people who might not live around here five and a half inches doesn't sound like a big number. Right, right. Uh, but this is a flat, low-lying place. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of people who have condos and houses that are two, three, four feet above sea level. Um, and when you have the highest tides of the year in the fall, uh, some of them already do flood streets right. occasionally. Like my street right here, uh, which I'm in Miami Beach, and they raised this street. This mm. used to flood like badly, like up to my knees uh, on on bad King Tide King Tide days when it would rain, especially right because yeah. the sewer systems wouldn't work at all. But now they've raised it, put in this very complicated, uh, sophisticated, crazy drainage system. It works perfectly, you know, for my little street and neighborhood here, but it's not practical as a general solution everywhere. It's just too costly. Yeah. Yeah. The, there's a lot of money uh, that has been put into that Miami Beach system with the mm -hmm. pumps and the, the roads being raised. And, and the uh, generators that you have to have on the pumps, because if the power goes out when the, when the heavy rain happens, then they don't work. And it's, uh, yes, because they've actually made the businesses more flood prone because of the way the system uh, works yeah. if the power goes out in a heavy rain. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, on, on the, the topic of, of the records, so we have 
much, much more frequently now we, we break record high tide levels uh, because it's almost impossible to break record lows now. Mm -hmm. um, even the lowest of low tides now is kind of what the mean was back 25 years ago. Um, and then, you know, we also measure the air temperature, the sea temperature. Same story with those. We're breaking record highs left and right. I mean, it's hard to keep up with it sometimes. As soon as I type up a message, of like, well, here, here's what just, here's the record we broke this weekend while I'm typing it. It's like, I feel like we broke a few more, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. It's, uh, it's crazy. That, so we do, do we know, talk about the tide issue first. Mm -hmm. Do we know exactly why that's happening? I know that there are, you know, are factors, obviously just thermal expansion of the ocean is one if, on the occasion that the ocean is warmer. But w why do we think that th there seems like there's been this surge of records uh, relatively recently is it related to the Gulf Stream or, wh or what's going on? Do we know? Uh, I don't know if we know for sure, but I do suspect and others suspect that it's related to that, to the Gulf Stream. And then the kind of the, uh, the root of the Gulf Stream right by us is the Florida current. Right. That's the narrow strip that flows between uh, the western Bahamas and uh, eastern Florida. So there's not much space in there. Right. And that's the Florida current that eventually becomes the Gulf Stream, which is a major circulation in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and there, I, I think basically a consensus, I wouldn't say a hundred percent, but people are thinking that the, uh, it, that the Gulf stream has slowed down, mm -hmm. which the Florida current in turn has slowed down. So it backs um, up the Florida current essentially. So the water has to go somewhere, right? That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. So if, if something's making the, the Gulf stream slow down and I don't have that answer, um, I know there's speculation it's because there's more fresh water in the North Atlantic yeah. uh, from melting glaciers and so forth. So, so yeah, there's more water be. coming from other sources than, than the Gulf Stream. But, but uh, I think that's mostly theory at this point, but yeah. reasonable theory. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that, seems, that could be. Seems it. Um, so when, when, when that slows down, I mean, you just picture, uh, you know, a, a flow of something moving away and you put on something that makes that flow slow down, just like you said, th that water now will just starts to pull back behind where it used to. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just us in South Florida. Uh, places up and down the U.S. East Coast are experiencing the same thing, which is why that makes sense as the reason. It's because that, uh, that ocean current runs up along the East Coast. Yeah, it's something happening farther north is the point. And it's not a local issue because I think um, in Norfolk and and up yes. there it's actually worse right the yeah the, 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 and even New York City uh, the the tides are are uh, yeah. higher I think uh, more aggressively higher than they are here in South Florida yeah. by a little bit yeah 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 no that, that's that's right so we we tend to think of ourselves as uh, in huge trouble down here like this is our own little world of Oh, the, the, you know, the mean sea level is rising fast and we're, uh, we're, we're a blip of it, but lots of other places are experiencing the same thing as we are and wondering how are we going to take care of this before we have serious problems. Yeah. Charleston, South Carolina is another one. Yeah. Uh, talking about the temperature that you measure there, mm -hmm. the, the air temperature. Uh, so why, why does it seem like it's, I'm not talking about the uh, Miami International Airport right now. That's a, a little bit of a different story. But there where you are, it's the environment is essentially the same as it's always been, right? There's no, it's not like at the airport where you could blame some of the factors on the, the all the urban development that's going on mm -hmm. around the airport. But you can't do that on a temperature gauge that's sitting on the water of Biscayne Bay. And, and you know, and I've been... Curious about how what you measure there tracks with at Fowey Rocks, or we do we do do we get an air we get an air temperature do we get an air temperature at Fowey Rocks I don't even remember but anyway do, do we know why uh, is it just simply that the ocean is warmer and that's why we have uh, all these warmer temperatures or is it because we have more wind off the ocean at night or you know what is it that's making the 
temperatures be so much significantly higher? I mean, record after record after record. It's crazy. Yeah, just crazy. Uh, I think the ocean temperature is a key component of it mm-hmm. because it is, a, you know, uh, it's it's on Virginia Key, which is small, mm-hmm. um, and it's right on the bay. Um, so it's it's very much in tune with what the, the bay is doing. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. So at, if that stays a degree or two warmer, almost certainly the air temperature will too. Yeah, uh, it's hard it's hard for it not to. Um, and, and we've seen that the water temperatures have risen as well. So I guess it's kind of the opposite where I said it's not that the wind is stronger of the ocean. The bay tends to get warm when the wind is light, right? Yeah, yeah. You would think, right? Because there's less yeah. mixing of the water and less ocean water being pushed into the bay and, and so forth. But anyway, there's a dynamic there between the wind and the water temperature. So a, a change in the wind, you would think, intuitively would affect the water temperature in some way or the other change. The yeah. Temperature. Yeah. And I, I don't know that we've seen a, uh, noteworthy sh- shift in wind speeds or wind directions, you know, in terms of like the bulk sense of things to, yeah. to have that impact. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we've, we've seen the increase in the, the ocean temperatures out there. And then just as an overall sense, I'm not just limited to Virginia key, but other stations all around, just the, the air temperatures have risen um, mm-hmm. also. So uh, even if it weren't on the ocean, it would behave in the same tune as many of the other stations are doing, like Miami Inter- International Airport, uh, which has some complicating factors, right. but absolutely a part of its upward trend is just the air temperatures are getting warmer. <laughs> right, right. Well, because you see it at Opelika too, even though you don't see... It's not as crazy at Opelaka, right. which is just up the road. I mean, it's Opelaka is the same distance, more or less, from the uh, ocean as as MIA is, but mm-hmm. it doesn't track on these extremes that we see at MIA. So there's something interesting going on at MIA. I'm not saying the sensor's bad. I'm just saying there's something something going on there that's uh, that's interesting. And is there any change, or do we know uh, in the the dew point, the amount of moisture in the air. It, it I mean, just, I, I remember back in the mid nineties, 95, I think it was, we had an incredibly humid summer because I remember the feels like temperature, the heat index at 11 o'clock at night when I was doing the news was over a hundred. seemed like for a whole stretch of that summer, it was hideous. And, and we'd have dew points of 78, 80, 82, crazy numbers. Now it seems like, though, we have the dew point of 78 a lot, but I don't know if that's, you know, different uh, or it just feels like it because because we're experiencing it now, you know, <laughs> with warmer temperatures. Uh, yeah, uh, so that, that's a good point. But to get, I guess that the first part is I don't, I don't know the answer to that. That's actually been on my wish list of things mm-hmm. to do when I have extra time <laughs> is to kind of come up with the... Uh, Kind of the, the means and the, the climatologies of uh, of what the dew point is here. I think that would be a pretty neat thing to have. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, as as we get warmer, we we just as being who we are, we we detect it a lot easier too. Yes. Um, yeah. That if, if it's two degrees warmer and just as high of a dew point as before, the heat index gets higher and we feel more uncomfortable and we tend to pay attention to it more. <laughs> like, oh, Well, it's an amazing thing. Like, you know, in the summertime here, uh, when the dew point is 73, it feels like an arid day. I mean, it's, it feels like a great summer day with a high of 90 or 91 and a dew point of 73. You think, wow, I, I, this is what a great day this is. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's a funny thing. Everybody else in the country would freaks out over a, a 73 yeah. dew point. But but that little bit of difference in the dew point and the temperature and that combination really does make it noticeably hotter. It is amazing how in tune we get to, to yeah. such small changes here because it, it varies by such a small amount, you know, from one yeah. day or one month to the next during the, during this time of year um, that, yeah, you, you notice if it's a 73 dew point or 75 or 76. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, so, well, 75 I always put as the normal summer dew point here. And if it was yeah. above 75, it was a 
worse than normal day and below 75 was like a bonus day. So, <laughs> so uh, what got you interested in weather in general and hurricanes in particular? Well, that, that goes back a ways. I think when, when I was uh, probably about four or so years old, it was, I, I uh, grew up in Eastern Pennsylvania and the first significant event I remember was snow, <laughs> a big, big yeah. snowstorm, which uh, produced about as much snow as I was tall. Mm -hmm. So that was, of course, a fascinating, fun thing. <laughs> That's exciting. I remember that when yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then the kind of the, the big push, which happened to be a hurricane, maybe not too much of a surprise. <laughs> Again, up in eastern Pennsylvania, this was I, I was in fourth grade at the time, and this was Hurricane Gloria. 1985. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that one just struck me as really amazing. We got off of school for it, um, which, you know, what kid doesn't like that? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it went beyond that. It was kind of this um, kind of this unknown, because to me, that was the first hurricane I experienced that we didn't even get, you know, the full force of it. it yeah, was yeah, it was offshore. Off, offshore. The East Coast hit Long Island. Uh, so, but yeah, but was there was there? I mean, did you know a hurricane was going by where you were? Yeah, yeah, you could. I mean, it was it was windy enough that it was you know tr tree limbs and mm -hmm. people lost power, and they actually kept the schools closed because they wanted to check on the roof safety and everything like that. It was yeah. in fairly impressive winds. Yeah, it was. Uh, a, I mean, it was a scary storm. There was a lot of angst in the Northeast when that was, you know, people were comparing it to 1938. And I mean, it was uh, and Donna and it was it was a lot of uh, energy around that storm. And, and the media certainly took big note of it. And there was some level of disappointment that it went farther east. Obviously, it was a wonderful thing, although not so great for the people on Long Island. But but it went a little farther east than the feared track was going to be. Yeah, yeah. Not that we knew um, anything about forecasting hurricanes in 1985, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but they did amazingly well, actually. For I shouldn't say that. They did amazingly well, those people back then. So you ended up um, for graduate school at, at Colorado State, uh, yeah, which is yeah. a great hurricane school, surprisingly, uh, in some significant measure, I think, because Dr. Bill Gray set up shop there in the, 70s and attracted such great students and and uh, that gained the school just a great reputation and that attracted more great students yeah. so is that what took you there or did you like the mountains for some reason <laughs> mm -hmm. um a little bit of both mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so when um i it's kind of there, there's a there's a fairly long story of how i ended up to uh to get into that field at all um but uh yeah so i i, I applied there they accepted me i went um <laughs> it turns out i didn't do hurricane stuff though at first it's, uh, i i didn't work directly with uh bill gray or wayne schubert or mike mm -hmm. montgomery who were mm -hmm. kind of the, the big three doing hurricane things right. there uh i went in and was doing some uh basically some some remote sensing work mm -hmm. of how to retrieve uh, moisture profiles, things like that. Um, but that's just that's kind of where I was able to get my foot in the door, I guess, so mm -hmm. to speak, um, mm -hmm. as a student uh, at CSU. Um, but I still loved hurricanes, and of mm -hmm. course, that was a great place to be, uh, even if what I was personally working on as a student wasn't involving hurricanes. There were still tons of people to talk to and lots of excitement about, you know, it was, you, you just, uh, you could just absorb information. Yeah. Um, uh, and then once, once I wrapped up with school there, uh, just as luck had it, I guess it was not necessarily a plan, but, uh, I ended up working there. Then I got to do hurricane stuff. Mm -hmm. So for another 10, 10, to 11 years, I was working there doing all, all sorts of hurricane stuff. Uh, and so was there a, an aspect of hurricanes that especially interested you, research, modeling, forecasting? You know, there's all kinds of different uh, roads to travel and still be interested in hurricanes. Yeah. So as it turned out, uh, the grant that I was on when I first started working there um, was my, my role in it was primarily for 
the the remote sensing and the uh, 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 observational end. Mm -hmm. um, I was working with uh, Wayne Schubert, who was kind of he's now a retired, uh, but uh, he he is a pen and paper kind of guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he can he can come up. He, he speaks equations like no one's business. Mm -hmm. um, but he likes having people it, it, on his team and in his group that can apply it to things or vice versa. Where you Do the coding and, and all that, no doubt. Yeah, yes. yeah. And, or, or even vice versa. We would see something like, wow, look what this aircraft observed. Or look, mm -hmm. what, look what this. And it would inspire him to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes it worked the opposite. He would come up with this idea that, for whatever reason, no one had ever come up with before. <laughs> and you're like, let's see if we can make, you know, is this something that happens in nature? And so, of course, well, let, let's go hunt for it. <laughs> so, all right. So uh, that was the, the aspect. So is that what, did, did you come to Miami to get closer to the hurricanes? Or was there a, a is it a grant kind of thing? Or is that how, how your part of the, the business works, where it really depends on what, somebody is trying to research and trying to figure out yeah it's, it's it's a it's a mix i mean there certainly is the uh the, the soft money aspect of it as it's called where it's uh what you're working on is a grant and it's typically three years long uh you might be on a few grants that are kind of offset from each other which is nice when that can work out um but where my, my place when i was at csu uh i kind of saw this kind of natural point, I guess, uh, where people that I was working with were getting ready to retire. I was like, okay, this is, my, you know, maybe a, a cue to mix things up a little bit and move around. I was in Fort Collins at that point for 13 years. Um, great place. Yeah, I, it's a great place. Yeah, 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 I live yeah. in Denver. It's a, I mean, I've been up and down the front range there. It's a, it's a great part of the yeah. world. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was a hard place to leave, but it kind of felt like eh, let's 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 see what's shaking down here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, um, like I said, you're closer to the hurricanes. So you you have a, a website that many people like me and you know, use people that are interested in in hurricanes that uh, that includes radar loops from just about every hurricane or typhoon that's come along in any recent years. I noticed the oldest loop is from Hurricane Andrew. Where what motivated you to develop the uh, the website, which has links? It's not just your stuff; it's links to everybody and the, the most prominent hurricane information sites. Where where did that all start? Uh, I mean, I, I started with websites and some, some of like the, the real time uh, hurricane information or other sorts of information like that. I, I mean, I first started websites in 1994 and five. Um, wow. I mean, the World Wide web didn't start until 94 or five, right? I mean, yeah. you were at the front end was, of, of www anything. It was text-based <laughs> browsing only. Oh yes. Well, okay. All right. Well, I remember that. So uh, yes, it, it was literally, so everything <laughs> was, you know, it was on DOS. Uh, yeah. That was before windows 95. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my first websites were designed for text browsers, no images, anything like that. Uh, so th things have evolved. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think actually that page with the tropical cyclone great radar loops is one with kind of a neat history. That was something I started. The, the first one I made in real time, uh, I, I, I sometimes go back and make them if, if I can, you know, like the one from 1992 I didn't make in real time. I made that much later, but right, yeah, because there's an archive of the images out of the Melbourne yeah. radar, and we don't really have an archive of the images out of the Miami radar, right? That I don't think they were. We didn't have a I mechanism for, for archiving archiving them. I don't yeah, think because that that the radar that got destroyed by Andrew in Miami was a WSR fifty seven, right? So it was be before the current version of radars that are out there. Yes. So it was a whole different world. Um, but I, I started that in 2001, uh, and, and then of course the 2004 and five seasons, mm -hmm. it, it exploded. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, but I started it mostly because it was something I was looking for. <laughs> I, you know, this, this store was like, 
you, you always would, you could you could find these different nations with their radar loops, whether it's Mexico or Cuba or China, whoever. You know, they would often have things out there that you can find, and they would often show a loop that was maybe an hour or two long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, we'll give the the URL in a, a little bit, but Brian has loops of like the whole hurricane from uh, from the beginning to the end and and it's amazing to actually watch it in in real time and it's a fantastic historic record of of uh, how storms de developed or fell apart or whatever happened to them as they were yeah. coming closer to land and therefore closer to the radar yeah and that, that's what kind of interested me as I wanted to watch what happened as storms were making landfall and it was like almost impossible when you're always stuck with watching the latest one or two hours of activity and then you refresh it and it's like, okay, now that old history is gone and you're up to, yeah. so that, that's what I, that's what I wanted to see. was like, okay, what has this been doing for the last eight hours or 12 hours? And it just didn't exist. So I decided to make it exist. Um, I had no idea at the time, of course, that this would still be happening um, 20 years later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. And, you know, one of the the most challenging things about that, and you just, you know, you wish the technology were a little different than it is, is that when you have a loop that goes on for days, <laughs> which which many of the loops do, right? Very often, you just want to see part of it. Mm -hmm. So I just throw my two cents um, worth and say, if, if somebody could invent a tool <laughs> that lets you choose the part of the loop you want to see, without having to look at the whole thing, that would be a wonderful thing. Right now, that, that tool is called me. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. I know uh, but it, you would think, right? I mean, because this isn't the yeah. only situation where you don't want to see no. the whole uh, the animated GIF or whatever it is that's, that is. Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, I, you know, I, up I, I completely file. agree. Um, but I, I, I mean, when, when I say that the tool is me, I, I, I totally mean that. If, if someone is looking at one of those and for, uh, you know, whether it's for a spot on TV or for a research presentation uh, and you and one of those loops isn't exactly what you want, just let me know. Like, yeah, yeah. seriously, I, I, I can I can work with you and we'll we'll make what you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, yeah, you have the, the data to to make a, yeah. another one. I get that. Uh, you, uh, so you write uh, for uh, Washington Post Capital Weather Gang, which I do on occasion as well. And um, a lot of uh, research uh, meteorologists don't actually go into communicating directly with the public. How did, how did you make that jump from really being a researcher to, uh, you know, writing columns and, doing public facing uh, communications that also has quite a long history <laughs> and it was almost the opposite way around oh, i really? started writing these uh basically the blog what, and now you have later. that and, and and not now you have and you've had that your your blog yes which goes back to to the 90s. 1996. 1996. Yes, insane. Uh, yeah, so that that's kind of how it started, though. Is I, I started that uh, during the 1996 hurricane season, and it was just to a handful of you know like friends and family who mm -hmm. were kind of interested in this because we actually had some of these storms affect the, the Northeast, mm -hmm. and I just had this idea of oh, why don't I just write something up that kind of just glues together these bits of information so no one has to know where to go hunt for everything. I just write up a little short blurb on it and it's your one-stop shopping of, well, here's what's going on. At least I, I know for today now. Uh, that again, I had no intention of that becoming a 1997 thing mm -hmm. and then a 1998 thing. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Yeah, it's, um, it's amazing how life works, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you make decisions um, when you're young and you're still kind of Live in it uh, when you're older. You know, I've said for years that professional forecasters are rarely surprised by what a hurricane does, but much of the public is always surprised by what a hurricane does. I mean, Laura is an example. It didn't mm -hmm. surprise us that it made a wobble and that storm surge didn't go up the river, right? But uh, in the same way that it would have if it had wobbled the other direction, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and I've also said that forecasting science is moving ahead much faster than our system or our ability for communicating the information 
to the public in a way that they can digest it and really understand it. So you have this, this uh, uh, difference, significant difference between what the forecasters understand and envision and what the public understands and envision. Do you agree with that? And, and what are your thoughts about how we communicate with the public you know, when we have these events occurring and, and how maybe that should be different? That's a, that's a good one. <laughs> um, we certainly have examples where you can have a forecast that's spot on. Um, but if that forecast and the impacts implied in it, uh, in terms of storm surge, wind speed, uh, rainfall, all the hazards that come along with it, um, if that's not effectively and accurately communicated, to the average person, there, there's, there is definitely kind of a, a, a hole in the process. Or you think yeah, of it that, like and that, which is very hard to do because there is so, there's just so much information. I mean, the hurricanes, landfalling hurricanes are extremely complicated things with all kinds of caveats on, on when you try and alert people to what the reasonable worst case of any aspect of it is yeah to what degree do you tell them but this is kind of the reasonable worst case the most likely is this other thing over here and uh, you know and then you have to throw out percentages and as soon as you start throwing out percentages then it really gets complicated because percentage you know if it's a 20 percent chance that sounds like a very low chance but a 20% chance of something really bad happening is actually a very high chance. So <laughs> how do you sort of retrain people's minds on the fly, which is really what what you have to do, you know? Uh, so anyway, it's a very, it's almost a rhetorical yeah. question to say, okay, well, how do we fix it? Right? No, it's, that's <laughs> yeah. true. Uh, yeah. I mean, and, you know, as you mentioned, I, I write blogs. There's plenty of other people mm -hmm. who, who do that angle of things um, as a, you know, non of official, I guess, means of communicating yeah, things. Me too. Um, you certainly, I mean, this is your thing, is how to communicate this stuff to the public, and you've been doing it well for a long time. Um, so, I mean, I, I could almost ask ask you the same question of, you know, what, what, what can be done to improve how you take what's coming out of the forecast and how to m marry that with what is seen out there in the world uh, and, you know, on whether it's on TV or on now, you know, like in, uh, little blurbs on the Internet is how do you maximize that time window and people's attention span to get that information out in an appropriate way um, that still conveys that there, there is uncertainty. Don't don't take that line and that edge of the cone as some magical thing. Right. Right. Well, it comes down to, I mean, we have a lot of problems in the modern world with, with communicating uh, because back in the day, back before we had phones and, and you know, Twitter and, and Facebook and things like that, uh, you know, people got their weather from television generally. Mm -hmm. So they never got the, you know, the, uh, you know, handful of characters version of it. They never got the just the tombstone version, which is what we call the forecasts on the phone. When you look up the, you know, the 10 day forecast on your Weather Channel app or whatever, or your local 10 weather app, it doesn't make any difference. You see these these Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday things and an icon and a temperature and so forth. People got more information about the weather back before that existed. Right. When I was doing the weather, I didn't go past five day forecasts and and I didn't go past the weekend unless it was a holiday weekend because I don't want to forecast too far in the future because I knew that it was mumbo jumbo. Now, now we make better forecasts of the future, but it's still kind of quasi mumbo jumbo when you talk about a week from now. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, yeah. But yet we, we crank out those forecasts because there's a demand for them graphically. Uh, so all that and much more, uh, Twitter being part of it and Facebook being part of it and all these varied opinions with varying levels of understanding of what they're saying, uh, you know, and even when there's good people, but it's fractions of the message, 
expecting the public to assemble it, mm -hmm. I think is is never just never going to happen. So good thing is when when a hurricane is threatening, people do still turn into television. So they get the longer version of the message, right? It's not so compacted, but it's this compacting that that is the antithesis of what you need when a hurricane is happening because it's such a complicated uh, yeah, process. Yeah, yeah. And I think in, another change that, uh, that that you bring up related to things like Twitter and Facebook and social media in general is anyone can have one of those accounts and say right. anything right. they want. Um, yeah, you a wouldn't world have of uninformed that. opinions is, uh, is yeah. For sure I mean, the there case. are yeah. legitimate and mm -hmm. informed and educated mm -hmm. people sharing things on those, but there are also not. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, and a lot of it is that. is is also it's not so much that the the people, but but they don't understand the impact. I don't think of what they're doing by throwing out you know two hundred and sixteen hour forecasts exactly. that happen to show a hurricane over Miami is is. Uh, harmful because it's not real information, it's, but yet it's it's it's, it's, it's cloaked noise. as real information. It looks like real information, right? So yeah, yeah so y the user has to be uh, informed when people do things like that, and a lot of a lot of that happens. Yeah, and you didn't have this, you know, when you go back to the era of just people getting their information from TV, like, right? Didn't exist the, exactly. The TV station did not just find someone walking by outside and say. You're on in five minutes. Yeah. Start talking. Yeah. Like, no, you actually had qualified people <laughs> to use that spot to talk about it. Yeah. And even back then, not everybody was a meteorologist, but but there was a sense that you went with the official word. So, you know, the, what the National Hurricane Center said, let's hear from the National Hurricane Center. That's, you know, more... We didn't have access to all the models. We, you know, so it was a different kind of situation. So, um, talk about modeling. So, you work on a number of projects to kind of better understand hurricanes and how to make uh, computer forecast models better. So, tell us about what you're doing and and you know what what's the impact of of this uh, the research, the kind of research you do. Yeah, um, I mean, as you mentioned, there's. I, I, tend to work on a few projects. I've got a few things cooking at, at all times. Mm -hmm. um, but I think some of the things that kind of fit in with this uh, in, in recent times, I've, I've often used um, either me me uh, actual me measurements from aircraft or uh, other, other instruments to validate what is output by a model. So, you know, you have this, we have, this is what we know happened in, in the atmosphere. This is what the, the model said happened in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. This is how the model is skewed or wrong mm -hmm. about something. So you, you kind of learn about how the model behaves that way. Um, one of the other projects involves um, how to use a high, a high resolution model to, to understand more what's happening over land, over mm -hmm. actual complex mm -hmm. land area so not just the intensity of the hurricane which is just some number uh, but the actual wind field over land which is kind of what's important because that's where we're at mm -hmm. right uh, so that's that's kind of one of the projects that's been going on lately so it sounds like you're you're trying to use models better to understand better how to uh, interpret the information how to uh, yeah, kind of exactly. validate it and and so forth. Well, that, I mean, which is we talked earlier about this idea of a consensus model. It's and I always say, oh, the consensus is the average is actually much more complicated than that these days in terms of how the most modern consensus models work and how they make that average. It's still an averaging mm -hmm. process in some sense, but it's more complex, yeah. right? So figuring out how to do that in an optimum way, I guess, is is what you're talking about. Yeah, and I, I think that's where a lot of people are starting to see the, the future with this is, I mean, we, we all want to tweak, tweak the models and increase the resolution and do this and this. But I think there's a lot of room to, to optimize, like you said, the models we've got mm -hmm. that, to kind of see where different kinds of models have skill, where and when different models have skill, and to say, okay, you're good at this in this scenario. This is where we put our our trust in you, this, 
we don't have much trust in you yet, so you you just wait. <laughs> yeah. you know, that's sort well, of so thing. way decades ago, uh, what is it? What year is this? 2020. So we're talking about 30 years ago. Um, I remember talking to Charlie Newman, who was a famous National Hurricane Center brilliant modeler, and and he's the one that really created the first, I think, real workable hurricane models at the Hurricane Center in the 80s. And he has papers going back to the 70s, actually, about mm -hmm. modeling. And and um, Charlie was the one that actually gave me the error ellipses that I used for the first kind of quasi cone that I used for Hurricane Andrew. And and he had different error ellipses for storms that were moving north off the Florida coast and ones that were going west in the Caribbean. So he, he had, you know, he had sort of subdivided these things to have a better understanding of how the forecasting worked in various scenarios, which is a kind of a version of what you're talking about is if you yeah. know that your errors off uh, of um, storms that come near Florida tend to be more to the right, which they did. It was, they were too fast and to the right. That was the, that was where the error ellipse was at that point. So I, when I when I did that first cone thing, I just took an average of all his different, uh, you know, different ellipses. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't try and make an ellipse. I, I made it just a circle around the, the forecast point and, you know, and just made a general statement of uh, what the errors might be. But but he was even way back then kind of thinking in those terms of uh, trying to understand how different forecasts might be biased. Seems yeah. like the same, same kind of idea, but oh, now we, we do it in a more advanced kind of way. Yeah, but the same thing. Uh, at the end of every season, the Hurricane Center goes through and they figure out what what this model's bias was at this lead time and this lead time and this model's bias. And, uh, it's It's... Still a thing. <laughs> yeah, it's still, the, it's still the same idea. Yeah. So uh, we talked about uh, climate and uh, how that was apparently and uh, kind of obviously affecting the the water and the temperatures and whatnot there at, at Virginia Key. But uh, climate and hurricanes is obviously uh, something of an open topic, but there's been a lot of research, uh, a lot of work done on it over the last few years. Um, and, you know, I think generally the consensus or, or maybe you tell me, but but I said the consensus is that hurricanes in a warmer world will be uh, stronger. And maybe there's research that says they might move slower with with uh, more rain and, and higher sea level. Is that a fair assessment? That's a very fair assessment. Yeah. I think that's kind of the, the best state of where things are at uh, is kind of likely that those things that, that you mentioned will uh, gradually become more common. Uh, you know, we don't ever assign any individual hurricane to climate change or any individual rainfall event to climate change, but you're, you're gradually changing the baseline that things you're, you're still going to have lots of oscillations and natural ups and downs and, right. Uh, all that stuff, but all those crazy ups and downs are gradually going to be acting on a higher baseline. Yeah, just like the the temperatures go up and down, but they go up and down at a with a slope to the up and yeah. downness, right? And yeah. Although, although I do think, and tell me if you think this is a fair thing, that whatever change is occurring or will occur in the next ten or twenty, thirty years, maybe in hurricanes. The fact that we are building so much more at the coast and there are so many more people at the coast uh, in terms of the hazard from hurricanes so outweighs any changes in hurricanes that that th yeah. the real discussion needs to be how we adapt to living at the coast, not uh, so much about how climate is changing hurricanes. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, yeah. This is a huge topic of interest, of course, because um, although there's not so far any real signal in an increasing number of hurricanes, um, so you know, that's, that's one thing that we're not so far able to detect is mm -hmm. that we're not, we're not seeing more storms. The, we have an increasing number of named storms, but that's sort of a 
a different yeah. thing because well we observe better now we have yeah you know, we, we we don't we name anything that is you know right at the definition where in the past it was somewhat more subjective i think yeah so but you know we there, there is a trend of the storms that do form gradually becoming more intense and raining more and things like that um but that's that's over a you know fairly long time period these, these, these aren't one year to the next or anything like that all, all of a sudden <laughs> everything's going nuts um but uh more impressively is as you said is the, the built in environment and the human environment we're, we're just putting way more stuff in harm's way on purpose yeah so anything that happens is automatically going to be worse yeah even though we build so much better just having so many more people uh that are living right at the coast it changes the dynamic tremendously because you can't possibly yeah. move the people you just can't it's just it's we're beyond that it's yeah it's, it's just undoable uh, uh so give us your uh, your website for people that want to go look at radar loops and amuse themselves sure. or other <laughs> or it's just a great place to go and get the links to great hurricane information to websites and so forth Sure. Yeah. Yeah. All these links are relatively simple to find on there because the, the main page of my website is kind of short. So uh, it says B McNoldy, M C N O L D Y dot Rasmus, R S M A S dot Miami dot edu. Right. All right. B McNoldy dot Rasmus dot Miami dot edu. All right, Brian, thanks very much. Appreciate your work on the website and, uh, and everything else. And uh, real nice talking to you. My pleasure, Brian. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Brian's website is a great resource. I use it all the time. So next week on the podcast, we're going to revisit Hurricane Dorian and talk about communicating during hurricanes that threaten South Florida with Local 10 anchors Calvin Hughes and Nicole Perez. It'll be fun, so I hope you'll tune in for that. So until then, for Luke Doris, who will be back next week, and I'm Brian Norcross, have a good week, stay safe, and please wear a mask. Thank you.